everyone. I just wanted to pop on to do a hopefully quick little debriefing video talking about the video we watched this week by UT Health Sciences Center at San Antonio, Texas, which I'll link down below when up here in the cards. Um, in this debriefing, I'm going to share some comments and questions that often come up when uh, my learners view this video. And there's five main topics that I'm going to focus on. The role of the clinic nurse, dental hygienist's scope of practice, communication between primary care providers and specialists, additional health and social care professionals, and then some of the key factors related to interprofessional collaboration that my previous learners identified as contributing to the health outcomes for Carter and Manny. So first off is the role of the clinic nurse. So something that, at least in the past, has come up quite a bit when my learners watch this video is questions about the role and scope of a clinic nurse or a primary care nurse. And usually the majority of my students, especially nurses, um, tend to work a little bit more in acute care so many aren't as familiar with this role. And fortunately, I used to work in a family physician's office, so I can provide a little bit of context here. Uh, so we see a healthcare professional um, in this video, who I'm assuming is a nurse, talking to Carter when he comes in for a visit with his primary care provider, which used to be my job. And she asks some really good questions, although my critique would be she's asking a lot of double-barreled questions, which means she's asking more than one question at once. And speaking from my own experience, there's a lot more stuff that I would have done in this assessment of Carter. Um, I would have had a lot more questions as part of my health history for one. I would have started the physical exam, done vital signs, um, although this maybe was just an editing choice on their part. Uh, when I worked in a clinic, um, my job also consisted of doing all of that and also doing a lot of uh, urine dips, immunizations, cryo-freezing warts, filling out a lot of lab racks, um, stuff like that. And I actually relate a lot more to the dental hygienist that we see at the beginning of the video in terms of what my role looked like. And speaking of which, we also get to see a really great exchange between the dental hygienist and the dentist before he goes to see Carter. So after examining him, I, uh, I noticed that there's several areas of inflammation, uh, bleeding when probing, and also loss of attachment since his last visit. Ah, interesting. Okay, let me examine him and we'll review the radiographs for a further sign of bone loss. Okay. And in my practice, at least, we didn't always do an oral report like this in between patients because while this is an outstanding example of interprofessional collaboration and communication, it just wasn't always feasible. Uh, so for context, in our clinic, patients were booked in 10-minute intervals, um, unless it was something that needed more time, like counseling or a pap smear. And as those of you in family medicine can probably attest to, sometimes an entire family shows up for an appointment, even if it was booked for one person. Uh, like initially, it was just the mom's postpartum follow-up, but now Johnny has a rash and little Stevie has a runny nose, um, which they're not supposed to do, but sometimes the physician just felt bad after they'd waited so long, so we would see them all and then we'd be further behind. Anyways, we were always just really pressed for time. Um, so usually I just charted my assessment um, but I would talk to the physician if there's something I had a concern about and wanted to touch base um, about before he went into the room. But yeah, sometimes I just put the chart on the door like the bad example we see with Manny's care. Oh, yours in two, Doc. And while I wish we had time to talk about each patient and ideally be in the patient's room together, um, that just wasn't always feasible. We were consistently behind by about an hour usually, and we never would have gotten through all of our patients if we talked like this about every patient. That being said though, different clinics may run differently, our end scope of practice differs by province, but that was just my experience. The next point I want to touch on is dental hygienist's scope of practice. So Carter's diabetes story starts with his dental hygienist, and often learners viewing this video wonder if checking blood pressure and glucose levels is normally within the scope of practice of a dental hygienist because they've never experienced this as a patient. And as luck would have it, I have had dental hygienists in my class in previous years who were able to answer this question for us. So here I'll share a quote from one of our graduates from our program named Zelda, who is a registered dental hygienist in Alberta, and she gave me uh, permission to share this quote with 5105. So she said, hi Rachel, thanks so much for thinking of me. Every province has their own provincial regulatory body governing dental hygienists, so I can only speak for Alberta. Much how like scope of practice can vary for other health professions. For example, the scope of practice um, for Ontario nurses is different than those in BC. In school, we were taught to provide a thorough medical assessment consisting of a risk assessment for overall health. And we see this in the video because the dental hygienist does inquire about um, Carter's health history. This is due to the fact that the mouth are the gateway to the rest of the body and infections can be absorbed through the bloodstream, for example, gingivitis periodontitis, as the video briefly describes. Assessing blood pressure should be done for all patients, especially those at risk for heart conditions. So if this isn't being done for you, it may be worthwhile talking to your dental hygienist about this, especially if you have um, any risk for heart 
um, conditions, although scope of practice will vary depending on where you live. Hygienists in Alberta usually only need to measure glucose levels on uncontrolled diabetic patients, but need to review their medical history and glucose levels at all visits. These assessments are conducted not only for oral health concerns, diabetic patients having higher chances of gingivitis and delayed healing and cavities, but also for an assessment of risk factors for local anesthesia as well. Hope this helps to answer any questions. So yes, blood pressure and measuring glucose is within the scope of practice of a dental hygienist, with the caveat that, of course, that this can vary between different regulatory colleges. Um, from viewing the video, I would assume that this was also within the scope of practice for the dental hygienist um, in the video, which was filmed in Texas. Communication between primary care providers and specialists. So in Carter's case, we see Carter's dentist call his primary care provider's office. And when Carter and Manny are discussing the call, Carter comments that his doctor and his dentist seem to talk a lot. I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like they should. They're in the same town. They probably play golf at the same place. And a lot of learners in my class who don't work in primary care or dentistry often ask, does this happen often? And from my experience and the physician learners who have watched this video in my class, unfortunately, no. Um, in my office, we saw more emails and faxes, um, MOAs calling each other. We were still doing paper-based charting. Uh, sometimes the physician would do calls with specialists, but it was often hard to get them on the phone with each other at the same time. And often this would be done over their lunch hour when realistically they should be getting to take a break and just eat their lunch. Reflecting on my own experience, it would have been great to see more communication, particularly with the dental world. Um, for example, in our practice, we had a lot of pregnant patients and dental health is a huge concern in pregnancy. Uh, physicians may reach out to colleagues and their peers, though, um, from their training to get advice as well. There's also electronic consultations where primary care providers can get patient-specific advice um, from specialists, um, including medical specialists and other professions like pharmacy and even diabetes educators. Um, I'm not sure if we have dentists or dental hygienists on these services, but that would be a fabulous addition if we don't already have them. Um, however, as many of my physician learners have pointed out with this video, um, in their experiences at least, that communications with other professionals doesn't look exactly like this. And a concern that they often raise, and which I found in my own research as well, is specialists in particular being worried about overburdening primary care providers because they're already so swamped. Um, in my research on e-consults, for example, um, specialists are game to add more communication and more feedback with the primary care provider, but only if primary care providers want this, because once again, they are worried about um, overburdening them. That's not to say we shouldn't be aiming for better communication, and Carter's case is an example of outstanding communication within and across different um, care teams. Um, but I do think we also need to be cognizant of the context that our healthcare professionals are working in. Additional health and social care professionals. So following Manny's surgery, the surgical team talks to presumably his partner, um, letting her know that they had to amputate his leg. And something that I and my previous learners always question is why they're having this conversation so casually in a hallway. Um, this is pretty life-changing news. And one of my previous learners who worked in mental health pointed out that ideally it would have been nice to have had a social or a mental health care professional present um, for this conversation, and ideally also doing it in a more private space. They also pointed out that a social worker would most definitely be involved in care afterwards, such as connecting Manny and his family to community resources, mental health supports, physio, occupational therapy, etc. Uh, so there are many more players that would be within Manny's circle of care than what we actually see in the video. And I would also hope that Manny, as well as his family, would be seeing some sort of mental health professional. Key factors related to interprofessional collaboration that contributed to the health outcomes of Carter and Manny. So I think we can all agree that Carter's case is an example of outstanding interprofessional collaboration, which contributed to his positive health outcomes. Manny's case, not so much. So some of the things that previous learners have said helped um, for some good interprofessional collaboration here were the professionalism of the team's accountability and communication, with communication being outstanding in Carter's case. In Manny's case, they noted that there was a lot of disengagement and little to no communication within the various teams or within um, Manny's larger circle of care. And I would also add the patient because patients are part of their care team too. Uh, learners also pointed out that in Carter's case, everyone caring for Carter probably felt really valued as a team member and they probably all valued interprofessional practice. Uh, some learners have also pointed out that looking at the case through more clinical eyes, there's also some concerns with the skills of some of the individuals providing care in Manny's case. Uh, for example, their general attentiveness, taking a detailed health history, doing a detailed exam, um, these sorts of things weren't always done very well. Learners also noted that it would also help each provider to understand the roles and the responsibilities of other healthcare professionals they're working with. 
And that's one of the reasons why I got you to introduce um, your role and what your profession is specifically last week. Anyways, these are just some of my thoughts on this video and some of the um, comments that previous learners have shared. Um, thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts and experiences this week. Typically in this module, I see a lot of stories about poor interprofessional collaboration or education in particular, usually due to hierarchy, not feeling heard by physicians, including as, as residents and junior doctors. And often people during this module realize that their quote unquote interprofessional team is actually multi-professional, not interprofessional. Um, so I thank you all for sharing these experiences. Uh, your experiences are valid and I commend you for being able to open up and share your experiences with the class. And we'll be talking more about some of these issues like hierarchy and conflict in module three. Uh, so keep these examples in the back of your mind until then. And that's all for now, folks. I'll see you all back here for module three.